want to ask you, as we get started this morning, to think about the last time you were amazed by something. I want you to think about the last time something completely astonished you. Maybe it was someone's talent that amazed you. Uh, my family and I had a chance this summer to go see a group called the Piano Guys in concert. And uh, it, was, it was a fantastic concert. At one point in time, the pianist uh, laid on his back underneath, with his head underneath the piano and played a song above his head like this. It was, it was amazing. I was astonished. Uh, I can't sit on the bench forward and play the piano, and he was playing it backwards above his head. Uh, maybe uh, you've been astounded by something ridiculous. You know, the world record for hot dog eating is 69 hot dogs in 10 minutes. 69 hot dogs in 10 minutes. A guy by the name of Joey Chestnut set the world record by eating 69 hot dogs with the buns in 10 minutes. Now, I like to eat. I'm pretty sure I couldn't eat six hot dogs in 10 minutes, let alone 69. I'm not sure I'd want to eat 69 hot dogs in the next 10 years, actually. <laughs> That's astounding. Maybe, though, maybe it wasn't something so trivial. Maybe, maybe you've been astounded by a statistic you've heard or a scientific fact that you just couldn't wrap your mind around. I'm always astounded and amazed uh, when space is the topic, outer space. You know, the closest star to us, other than our sun, is almost 25 trillion miles away, trillion with a T. Now, to put that in some context, if you were to get in a spaceship that traveled 1,000 miles per hour, 1,000 miles per hour, it would take you almost 3 million years to get there. That's the nearest star. Scientists estimate that the number of stars in the universe is somewhere around the neighbor of 100 octillion. That's one with 29 zeros after it. And these stars are pretty far apart. So when you think about the size of the universe, it's, it's just, it's mind-boggling. It's amazing, astonishing. Well, there is a word in ancient Greek used to describe the idea of being astonished. It's the word ekplaso. It means to be out of your senses, utterly amazed, completely dumbfounded, left at a loss for words. And that word is used four times in the Gospel of Matthew. Four times. Each time it's used, it describes people's reaction to Jesus. But each time it's used, it describes the response not to a miracle, but to his words. And the first time the word astonished is used is in Matthew 7, 28, which says, And when G Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished by his teaching. He had just finished preaching a sermon that we know as the Sermon on the Mount. And the people were dumbfounded. I have the privilege this morning of introducing to you our sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And it's our hope, it's my hope, that through this sermon series, we will come to understand why those people were so astonished. In some ways, it could be argued that the Sermon on the Mount needs no introduction. No sermon ever preached has been more significant to the Church of Jesus Christ than the Sermon on the Mount. It's the best known, it's the most extensively studied sermon in the world. And for all of us who believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, no portion of Scripture could be more important for us in defining what it means to follow Christ and what we as God's people should look like. Now, these words were spoken about 2,000 years ago, but they're just as relevant today as they were when they were first spoken. 
One theologian said, after 1,900 years, the Sermon on the Mount still haunts men. They may praise it, as Gandhi did, or like Nietzsche, they may curse it. They cannot ignore it. On the other hand, our secular culture has grown more and more ignorant of the Sermon on the Mount. According to one author, a recent Gallup poll concluded that only one out of three adult Americans are familiar enough with the sermon to identify Jesus as the source. Many Americans in the survey thought Billy Graham had preached the Sermon on the Mount. There is one verse in the Sermon on the Mount that uh, all Americans seem to be very familiar with and love to quote, even if they quote it out of context. Some of you know where I'm going. Matthew 7, 1. What is it? Judge not, lest you be judged, right? Seems to be the only verse in the Sermon on the Mount most people know. John Stott said this, the Sermon on the Mount is probably the best known part of the teaching of Jesus, though arguably it's the least understood and certainly it is the least obeyed. The fact is that as much as the secular world may be losing familiarity with this famous sermon. Christians are very familiar with it. And that familiarity can sometimes be our enemy. It can make it difficult to really be astonished and amazed and arrested by the things that Jesus says in this sermon. Jesus makes some pretty radical demands in the Sermon on the Mount, and he makes some pretty radical promises. And the original hearers, these truths were revolutionary to them. And if we would take it seriously, they'd be revolutionary to us too. And God does call us to take them seriously. So to do the Sermon on the Mount justice, we need to set it in its context. And I'd invite you, if you haven't already, to open up to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew, the first gospel, the first book in the New Testament. And when we get to Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is rather early on in his ministry. Matthew chapter 3, he had been baptized by John. Matthew chapter 4, the Spirit of God leads him out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. He is tempted, he triumphs over that temptation, resists that temptation, and he comes back into Galilee and he begins his ministry of preaching and teaching and healing. And by now, by the time we get to Matthew 5, he'd begin to draw some crowds. Look at Matthew 4, 23. He went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria. Look at verse 25. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. So Jesus is wandering around Galilee, that's northern Israel, and he's got these huge crowds just following him everywhere. But they're not even all Galileans. Some of them are from the Decapolis, that's east of the Sea of Galilee. Some of them are from Jerusalem and Judea, that's down in southern Israel. Some of them are from beyond the Jordan, to the east of the Jordan River. And these crowds are following him around. And look what Matthew says in 5.1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Seeing the crowds... Look, it's not that Jesus hadn't seen them before. Matthew's making a point here. The point he is making is that Jesus intentionally preaches this sermon with the crowds in mind. Most of what Jesus says in this sermon is to his disciples, but he says it in such a way that he wants the crowds to hear. Jesus, at, at this point in time, would have essentially had three layers of listeners. Close to him, he would have had the men that he called to be his disciples, the ones that will later be called the apostles. He hadn't called all 12 of them by this point in time, but some of them he had called. Beyond that, he would have had a group, we could call them the small d disciples. That is, people who believed Jesus, wanted to follow him, men and women both. But beyond that, there's this massive humanity humanity 
who were curious about this guy who was wandering around preaching and teaching and healing. Most of them weren't actively believing in him, but they were curious about what he was doing. And Jesus' words are intended for all of these people to hear, even if some of them weren't ready to apply them yet. And Matthew says, seeing those crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain. Now, once again, Matthew's not interested in giving us a lesson in topography here. The Gospel of Matthew was written to Jewish Christians. And anyone who was familiar with the Old Testament would recognize the significance of a large number of Israelites following a man who went up on a mountain. Right? Who are they thinking of? Moses, who went up on the mountain and received the law of God and delivered it to the people. Now you have Jesus, the second and greater Moses, and he goes up on a mountain, and he's going to give to Israel a new law. A new law, one that was different in, from the first one in a number of ways. This law wasn't an external code of rules. This law was a set of principles and ideals and motives. This law was the law Jeremiah was talking about when he said God would take the law and write it on their hearts. That was this law that Jesus is going to deliver to the people. And when the people hear it, they are astonished. They're astonished. The Jewish people were waiting for their Messiah. And the thought of the day was that when the Messiah came, he would defeat Israel's enemies, he would gather the scattered nation, he would restore Jerusalem, and he would rule the world as king from Zion. Israel would be rewarded, the nations, their enemies would be put down, brought into subjection, and all of this would be accomplished by direct intervention from God himself. Well, Jesus says the king has arrived, and the kingdom had arrived with it. Look at verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 17, just above where we are. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When he says it is at hand, it literally means it's right here. It's right now. It's present. Jesus was the king, and those who would be members of his kingdom must be willing to submit to his rule as king. And in this sermon, Jesus is going to declare what it means to be a member of the kingdom of heaven. That's why we've titled our sermon series, as you can see up here, Kingdom Living. Kingdom Living. This Sermon is what it looks like to live as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Now, I want to talk about that idea of the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. Those words mean the same thing, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. There's a sense in which, of course, we affirm that the kingdom has not yet come, right? There will come a day when Jesus Christ will rule and reign on this earth. Amen? The kingdom is yet future. And yet, there is also a sense in which the kingdom of heaven has come. Jesus told his disciples that the kingdom of heaven is within you. He told his disciples that the kingdom of heaven is among you. So the kingdom of heaven exists within every Christian and within every Christian church. We think of the kingdom, when you think of that term, think of... A, a reign. Where does God reign? Where does Christ reign? Christ reigns in the hearts of his people. And Christ reigns in every church that obeys him and follows him. So the kingdom, the kingdom has come. The kingdom is here. And the kingdom is yet to come. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. It's a different kind of kingdom. And the lives of those who would live in that kingdom need to look dramatically different than those who are members of the kingdom of this world. You know, you don't have to do anything to be a member of the kingdom of this world. You're born into it. But to be a member of the kingdom of heaven is quite different, and it will look different. So this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, is not about politics. It's not about social reform. 
It is about what it looks like when men and women submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ in their lives. This is a very, very practical sermon. In, this, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to come right into your kitchen. He's going to get right into your living room. He's going to go right into your workplace and how you interact. The Sermon on the Mount is about what kingdom living looks like. And I've given you an outline in your bulletin. If you go to the very end of your bulletin, the end of the second page, I've given you an outline of the Sermon on the Mount. This is how it breaks down. The citizens of the kingdom, the righteousness of the kingdom, and an exhortation to enter the kingdom. And that's the outline we'll be following as we walk through this sermon over the next several weeks. This morning... I want to give you some reasons why the Sermon on the Mount is so important for us to understand. I want to give you some reasons why the Sermon on the Mount was so astonishing to its listeners. Number one, number one, the sermon, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus shows us God's righteousness and character. He shows us God's righteousness and character. The sermon is like a window into heaven where we can look into heaven and see the character and righteousness of God. You know, to know a person, you need to know what's important to them, what they treasure, what they enjoy. You think about marriage. I can't claim to really know my wife if I have no idea what her priorities are or what's important to her or what she likes, right? Right? When uh, Libby and I first got married, I used to buy her flowers. You know, I'm a man, she's a woman, you buy flowers. This is kind of the way it works, right? You bring home flowers. My wife doesn't care for flowers. <laughs> she, she just, they don't mean anything to her. The ones that plant in the ground, those are okay. But like bringing home a bouquet was just meaningless to her. And after a couple of years of some subtle hints, like... Darren, I don't like flowers. Stop buying them for me. <laughs> I finally picked it up. You know, she really doesn't like flowers. Saved me a lot of money. <laughs> After 18 years of marriage, I feel like I know my wife pretty well. I feel like I know what is important to her and what she likes, what her priorities are, what she values. Jesus Christ is king. And if you want to know him, you need to know what's important to him. You need to know what he values, what he cherishes, what he treasures, what he blesses. What kind of people does Jesus bless? Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful. By the way, those ideas aren't plastered onto very many motivational posters. You know that? You don't see a lot of posters put up about meekness and mourning. But this is who King Jesus blesses. What's important to him? Well, what's important when you read the Sermon on the Mount, you find what's important is holiness and obedience. That's important to him. Matthew chapter 5, verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. Holiness is important to Jesus. And how does he define that holiness? How does he define, define obedience? It's not by conformity to some external standard. The Sermon on the Mount consistently smashes to pieces the idea that you can put on holiness on the outside. It's not by merely avoiding some big sins. You know, well, uh, avoid murder, adultery, theft, that kind of stuff. The Sermon on the Mount tells us that God's view of holiness penetrates a whole lot deeper than just the big sins that people see. It's not by performing acts in order to appear righteous. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 3, But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. This is not about appearances. It's not by maintaining the lowest possible level of obedience. What do I got to do just to get by? Like, I'll just, I love my family. I love my neighbors, right? That's good. And Jesus says, so what? So do the pagans. So do the pagans. 
in the Sermon on the Mount, we get a view of what the Lord thinks is good and right and holy. And it ought to shake us up. It's a lot different than the world's view. Our king isn't like the kings of this world. The ethic of the Sermon on the Mount is contrary to a lot of what you'll hear and see out there. And by the way, not just in the secular world, but in the religious world. Think about this. Jesus didn't preach the Sermon on the Mount to a bunch of atheist pagans. Jesus preached to very religious people, very religious people. And what he said astonished them. Think about it. He, he preached to the Pharisees, the Pharisees who were all about external behavior, looking righteous. And he condemns them. The whole message of the Sermon on the Mount is that true righteousness has to do with your character. It has to do with what's within Matthew 6, 1, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you'll have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. How about the Sadducees? They were the, the religious liberals. They were the ones who were in charge. To them, God wasn't concerned about holiness. And the Sermon on the Mount tells us they are wrong, that God is concerned about holiness. You have the Essenes. The Essenes were the ones who uh, believed they needed to get away from everyone. They were the separatists. They believed the route to pleasing God meant getting away from all the riffraff, getting away from all the evil people. And as long as they stayed away from evil people, God would be pleased with them. And Jesus says, you're missing the point. Because the biggest sinner in your life is you. And you can't get away from you. They're the zealots. The zealots are the activists and the rebels. They, they hated Roman rule. They longed for revolution. They wanted to overthrow their oppressors. And Jesus tells them in Matthew 5, verse 43, you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. All of these errors demonstrate a wrong view of God and his character. And all of these errors are still present with us. And we need to battle against them. Those who would focus on outward behavior and conformity to some external standard as a sign of godliness. Those who believe God doesn't care much about holiness. He's, he's just indulgent and permissive. Those who think that the best way to avoid sin is to stay away from sinners. Those who want to fight back and defend their right to do this and do that rather than laying down their rights. None of these perspectives is consistent with the true character of God. It's good. It's good for us to be reminded of the character of our God and what he values, and what he treasures, and what he finds important. It's good for us to be reminded of who God is, and what he is like, and what he values. And I trust and pray that the Sermon on the Mount will do that for us. Another reason why the Sermon on the Mount is so important is that, number two, it shows us our depravity and our desperation. It shows us our own depravity and desperation. The, the sermon is a mirror with, that we look into and see our own soul. No one, no one can read the Sermon on the Mount with any degree of integrity and say, ah, I'm pretty good. Ah, I, that describes me since the day I've been born. I have just lived that way. No one can do that with any degree of honesty. Matthew 5, 22, I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. You ever insulted a brother? Matthew 5, 28, I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. 
For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Are you withholding forgiveness from anyone? Verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Are you free of the love of money? Jesus says it's not, you, it's, there's no in-between. It's either love and hate or love and hate. Matthew 7, verse 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. How are you doing? In every relationship, are you always treating everyone else the way you would want to be treated? Verse 21, this is the ultimate one. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Not everyone who thinks they're okay with God will enter heaven. And remember, he's not talking to atheists. He's talking to religious people. He's talking to people who call Jesus Lord. but they haven't done the will of God. Don't let the familiarity of these verses lull you to sleep. Do you, do you, hear, do you hear what we just read? Do you see the standard? Do you see how impossible the standard is? This is what you have to, to have, to, have inher- to inherit eternal life. And if God marks iniquities like this, who, who can stand? We had better realize we are in big, big trouble. This sermon is a call to unbelievers, especially good, moral, church-going unbelievers. This is the standard you will be held to. And let me ask you, on that day, on that great day when you stand before God and have to give an account for your life, what are you going to say? I never murdered anyone. I never committed adultery. I never stole anything. And God is going to say, you're a murderer, and you're a thief, and you're an adulterer, because that begins in the heart, and no one can claim purity there. No one. On that great day, you will be found either in Christ or lost forever. The Sermon on the Mount drives us to the gospel. We are all lawbreakers. We all fall short. We all have a sin problem that needs to be dealt with. Our only hope is that there's someone, someone, who has lived this this sermon out perfectly and that we can somehow benefit from that. And that's the gospel. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus knew no sin. He never fell short on any of these requirements. And he offers himself as a sacrifice for us that our sinfulness might be forgiven. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become his righteousness. The demands of the Sermon on the Mount are greater than any man can say he has kept, save one. And only if we're found in him is there any hope. Is there any hope? That's why it's foolish, by the way, it's foolish to see the Sermon on the Mount as a set of ethical principles that we should employ in the world to make the world a better place. It doesn't work that way. Before you can live this kind of life, you have to have life. A child has to be born before he can obey his parents, and you must be born again before you can obey God. That's why Jesus says in John 3, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If there was ever a sermon preached that leveled the playing field, that condemned us all, from the wickedest criminal to the most holy religious person, it's this sermon. No one escapes. No one gets away with thinking we're okay. No one can claim to be righteous. All are condemned.
And so for all of us, the only hope is the gospel. If you know Christ, if you have confessed your desperate need for Christ, if you have turned to him in repentance and faith, if he is your Lord, if he is your hope, then you can rejoice because you belong to Christ. But if you are here this morning, if you are here this morning and you think you're doing okay and your moral life will get you by, you have no hope. You have no hope. You need to flee to Christ, repent, and believe the gospel. The third reason the Sermon on the Mount is so important for us is that it shows us how to please God with our lives. It shows us how to please God with our lives. That is, the sermon is a guide for Christians on how to live. Now, there are Christians out there who maintain that what Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount isn't for us today. I mean, you know, the demands of the Sermon on the Mount are hard. And so some fi- try to find ways to alleviate the sense that we have to obey this. Some would say, well, it's, it's not for this era. It was for, maybe it's for the Jews in Jesus' day, or it's for uh, some future time, but not for this era. Some would say, well, it's hopeless to try to live this out, so let's not even bother with trying. That's not what it's there for anyway. Let's just look to Jesus for our righteousness and uh, don't bother with the actual commands here. Others just try to water it down. Like, uh, this is really difficult, so let's just make it a little more palatable. Keep it, uh, keep it general, spiritualize it, but don't take it too seriously. And all of these approaches miss the mark. In this sermon, Jesus is revealing what his kingdom is like and what his people are like. This is an ethic that can and must be lived out in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is true. It is true. And no one can live this out in their own flesh. But it's equally true that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are called to live this out. Every Christian, every Christian has the presence of the third person of the Trinity within The power of the Holy Spirit dwells within every believer. And with that power, it is possible to be meek and humble. It is possible to rejoice when persecuted. It is possible to love your enemy. It is possible to give with the right motive, to bear good fruit. And one of the reasons I know this is possible, one, because it is in Scripture, but two, because I have seen it in you. So many of you, I see the power of the Spirit working in, and you are doing these things. And I praise God for that. We won't be perfect. We can't be perfect. We are in the flesh, and so we'll fail. It's been said that sanctification is about direction, not perfection, right? And the Sermon on the Mount is a sermon that we want to hold on to and believe and strive with the power of the Holy Spirit to live out. We won't be perfect at it, but we want to live to please the king. And the way you live to please the king is to be like the king. And Jesus gives us some wonderful incentive for living this way. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Matthew 5, 13. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. Verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. Verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. If we were honest, we would admit that oftentimes the thing that most repulses people from Christianity is Christians. 
right? Maybe it's a godliness that just, a godliness that focuses on external behavior and the inside is full of darkness. Maybe it's a, a Christianity that's always fighting for the rights. Maybe it's a Christianity that longs for the destruction of her enemies. But when you live out the Sermon on the Mount, this draws people. It attracts people to Christ. People notice, people notice when there's a real holiness within. People take notice when a man loves his enemy. People will sit up and listen when we're quick to forgive or when we turn the other cheek when wronged. That's kingdom living. This is the kind of living that makes people take notice. And this is the kind of living that Jesus endorses and requires of his disciples. This is why he says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that, on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you as desperate people. We come to you claiming no righteousness on our own. We come to you even, Lord, as those whose righteous deeds are infected with wrong motives. And so we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. We come to you thanking you for the gospel, thanking you for the work of the Holy Spirit on the cross to redeem us and to forgive us. We come to you as your children, Father. And we come, Lord, pleading with you that your spirit would do a good work in us. We pray, Father, as we walk through the Sermon on the Mount together, we pray you'd make us into a holy people. Not a holiness that is merely external and tacked on and man-made standards, Lord, but a, but a holiness that is real and from within, a holiness down to the depths of our bones. Lord, we need you to do this work in us. And we thank you for your grace and mercy for the many times that we fail. Lord, make us into a holy people that Jesus Christ might be glorified. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.